Hey, um, remember, we're looking at uh, the Mayan calendar, and I think we've um, sort of expanded it a bit to include um, end of the world scenarios. So the question we're asking is this, what should we think of uh, the things we hear that potentially threaten uh, the end of the world? Now we need to realize there's always going to be things that threaten to end our existence. I think since I've been in this church, I've heard several, several that may be more public than others, but uh, some people seem to find a reason to think that we're in, in the face of a cultural meltdown, I think just about at all times. So how should we, uh, how should we deal with those things? And uh, the first thing I think we can possibly learn from what we were looking at last week is um, it's quite possible sometimes if we just simply look at the evidence for the position itself, maybe just you know, consider uh, what it is that's being said, it's possible that um, some of these theories on how the world is going to end could uh, fall of their own weight. And I think uh, that's what we had with the Mayan calendar. So I thought I'd just begin a little bit of, inter uh, a little bit of review. Remember that uh, we, we found that the ending of the, of the date or the end date, which is what, December the uh, 21st, something like that, 2012, was actually a, a political maneuver on the part of the king who um, happened to be in power at the time that the calendar was um, calibrated. And we read from at least one person who knew the, um, who knows the Mayan culture, some, some things of this effect. He says the text talks about ancient political history rather than prophecy. Uh, this is from Marcelo A. Canuto, director of uh, Tulane University's Middle American Research Institute. He says, according to the archeologists, the, the 2012 reference would have been a political move by the Ka uh, Calic Mole King who wanted to reassure the peoples of La Corona after the stunning defeat. The key to understanding the reference to 2012 is a unique title that the king gave himself, said the archaeologists. In the text, he calls himself the 13th Ka'atun Lord, the king who presided over and celebrated an important Mayan calendar ending, 13 Ka'atun calendar cycle in the year 692. In order to vaunt himself even further and place his reign into an eternal setting, the Maya king connected himself forward in time to when the next higher period of the Maya calendar would reach the same 13 number, December the 21st, 2012. So anyway, that's the reason why the calendar ends on that particular date, or at least this particular calendar does. And I, I think we also looked at the fact that there is evidence that the calendar itself and those who uh, calibrated the calendar, the Mayan calendar, didn't, you know, they didn't actually see the calendar as ending. Uh, I have another quote here, let's see, uh, from David Stewart of the University of Texas. He says, it is going to keep going for billions, trillions, octillions of years into the future. Numbers we can't even wrap our heads around. The Maya, cal uh, excuse me, the Maya recorded time in a series of cycles, including 400-year chunks called Bactoons. It's these Bactoons that have led to rumors of an end of the world catastrophe. So here's, I guess, another theory on why it ends on December the 21st. Actually, it does fit with what we've seen. On that date, a cycle of 13 Bactoons will be complete. But the idea that this means the end of the world is a misconception, Stewart said. In fact, my experts have known for a long time that the calendar doesn't end. After the 13th Bactoon, it simply begins a new cycle. And the calendar encompasses much larger units than the Bactoon. So anyway, uh, again, here was an end of the world scenario. I think uh, we saw last time that something like 10%, 12% of the people of the United States believe that this is actually threatening the end of the world, that we should uh, pay attention to this and be ready for it. Now, again, just examining the theory uh, on its own merits um, can sometimes uh, remove the threat. As we see, the, uh, the Mayan calendar isn't really a threat at all anyway. Uh, of course, why would we listen? Uh, to what they had to say anyway. I mean, we have no evidence that the Lord has given them any insight. Now, what though if we examine an end of the world scenario and we find out that they are a real threat? What should we do in a case like that? Here's where I'm going to pull on resources here, yes. Examine the scriptures. Okay, examine the scriptures exactly. 
And what should we expect to find when we come to the scriptures? What do the scriptures actually tell us that bears on the subject? Okay, now we're going to see this evening that um, that is true with regard to the second coming of Christ, but in many of the um, scenarios that the church holds to, uh, the world doesn't end when Jesus Christ returns. Okay, but still, that is a very important event. So. All right, now last week, or last, two weeks ago actually, we did uh, find a passage there that reminds us that uh, the Lord has actually revealed to us Everything that is important for us to know. Uh, Amos 3, 7. Surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. Now again, who is it that's going to bring about the end of the world? Is it going to be man? No. It's going to be God. Now the Lord says that he will not do anything unless he first tells, unless he first reveals it actually through uh, the prophets. So we have everything that we need to know in scripture regarding the end of the world. So now again, it's already been pointed out, we don't know the specific day or the hour, but we do know enough, I think, to know the seasons in which the Lord is coming. And if the Lord has told us, and of course, um, you know, provided we believe that it's true, what should it actually um, give to us? What should that give to us? How, how can that help us? Gives us hope, that's right. It also gives us a great deal of comfort, doesn't it? Because if you hear, for instance, that um, you know, a certain kind of bee mites can destroy all the bees and destroy all the food and so forth, I mean, it might be a reason for concern. But we do know that it's not going to bring about the end of the world because for one thing, that's, well, the Lord has told us that's not the way the world is going to end. But uh, Romans 15, 4, we read this. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now, I do think that in the context, the hope that we have there, of course, refers to eternal life, but I also believe that the Lord has revealed more things in scripture than just that specific thing. The Lord has actually told us what's going to happen in the future, and actually knowing those things, it can give us comfort and can give us hope that these things that we're concerned about aren't going to destroy the world. But now here's, here's one further thought as we kind of go down this particular uh, avenue of, of uh, thinking. Uh, what if a uh, potential threat might actually line up with how God says he's going to end the world? <laughs> you know, what do we do in a case like that? I, here's actually uh, one example, uh, the Manhattan Project. You know, when plutonium had been uh, developed in uh, the uh, cyclotrons, I guess, and it was relatively new, and people didn't know exactly how it was going to react uh, when they caused a, a chain reaction to take place in it. Uh, here's, here's one quote from um, uh, at least uh, an article looking back at that project as far as what some of the people thought. It said, plutonium had not existed four years earlier, and no one was totally sure what reaction there would be when the bomb was detonated, talking about the first atomic bomb. There were varied opinions as to what might happen. Some believed it would fail to explode. One scientist, the brilliant physicist Enrico Fermi, went to the other extreme and believed that it would set fire to the Earth's atmosphere and create huge fires around the world. I think, um, I, well, I think Einstein was quoted, but uh, I think he may have denied this, that the possibility exists that the chain reaction that was started within the plutonium might actually cause a chain reaction in other elements as well and cause uh, the entire creation, as it were, to, to blow up. So if you have a scenario like this, I mean, you think about how the Lord actually says the world is going to end, and, and what does he say about that? What's going to happen to the present heavens and earth? What's that? Destroyed by fire. It's going to pass away with a bang, as it were, and the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. I mean, if you're, if you're reading articles about the Manhattan Project back in those days, and you look at the scriptures, you might wonder if this is going to be the event that's going to lead to the, uh, the end of this uh, creation. Now, why, why would we have supposed that that wouldn't be the case? Or would we have any reason to suppose? Maybe in some scenarios, we, 
Some Christians might have thought this, this was the end, or this could have been the end. But the question we really need to ask is, could it really? Uh, is that what the scripture actually indicates? Could the world have ended back in those days? And I think, um, I, I personally, of course, I don't think that could be the case for a number of reasons, and we want to look at that uh, this evening. But um, let me ask you this question. Again, just by way of review what we've seen um, over the past several Lord's Days. Uh, why did the Lord create everything that he created? For his own glory. And then more specifically? As a stage to work out redemption. As a stage to work out redemption, right. Now, if the Lord is going to allow the world to come to an end, it presupposes that that work is, is complete and it's come to an end. And the question we need to ask is whether or not that is in fact what the Bible says. Now remember, we're talking about end of the world scenarios. And the end of the world isn't necessarily in some of these scenarios when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, right? It depends on your particular view. So why don't we just take a little bit of time and, and think about the different views that the church has regarding the end of the world or at least what we call eschatology, last things, you know, things that are going to happen at the very end of the world. What, what are the different uh, positions, again, that we have uh, uh, represented in the church as far as uh, millennial positions? Because that's what really what we're talking about here. Okay. So let me just, let me go ahead and, and put this up here, and I'm going to put, I'll just abbreviate them, pre-mill, and there's actually... Uh, two different varieties of pre-mill. There's historic pre-mill, there's um, dispensational pre-mill, and again, we're not going to get all the way into this. Uh, what else is there besides pre-mill? Okay. A, or what we might call amil, depending on your pronunciation, and then uh, post, okay. All right, now let's see. On the, uh, now the historic pre-mill might be one that's a little less familiar to us. Excuse my wiggly. Uh, trying to make straight lines here. All right, let's just consider for a moment uh, when the end of the world actually takes place in each of these uh, scenarios. Um, according to, let's say, well, Again, if, if you understand this position, according to historic pre-mill, what's the next thing that we're actually looking for on the horizon as far as what the Lord is intending on doing? Does anybody have any ideas? I'll give you a hint. If you're familiar with dispensational premillennialism, it's virtually the same, except I believe most historic pre-mills believe that when the tribulation period comes, we're going to go through it. Okay, so let's, since these are very, very similar, let's, uh, let's see, okay, why don't we put this here, we'll, we'll make this the uh, tribulation period, and as you know, that's a seven-year period according to uh, dispensation, or excuse me, dispensational, I think, premillennial views. Okay, so the next thing that we're looking for is the tribulation, right, if you're historic premill, and uh, it could, it could happen, well, According to historic pre-mills, it could happen any time. I think that's generally the case, right? Now, um, actually, when the tribulation begins, then you've got this seven-year period that has to take place, at the end of which, what's, what's going to happen at the end of this tribulation period? Okay, the rapture and... Um, okay. All right, so here we have the second... Second coming of Christ. Okay, and then what follows? Okay. So the millennial reign of Christ, and that's basically a thousand years. Now, on the historic pre-mill view, how long is it until the end of the world? At least how many years? At least a thousand and seven. <laughs> Okay, at least. Now, there's still time, you know, coming up to this point. Now, at the end of this time, of course, would be the judgment 
This would be the judgment of, you know, judgment of the wicked. And I believe that's the case here as well. So there would be the great, great white throne judgment, after which, at this point, we have the, um, well, here, here's the end of the world, okay, right here at this point. Okay, so on this view, you have the end of the world, 1,007 years to the end, if, if this is in fact correct. Now, in the dispensational premo, Well, actually, the second coming is still in the same place. <laughs> yes, yeah, the first, second coming. <laughs> so this, this is the, uh, the coming of Christ for his church, and then this is the coming of Christ to judge the nations. So, and then at the end, there's a coming of Christ to destroy the wicked at the end of the millennial period. So anyway, so Christ, Christ comes here for the rapture. But there's still seven years, and there's still a thousand years. And so in, in, this, in this view, what is it that the dispensational pre-mill is, is looking to happen next? What, what are they waiting for? Okay, they're waiting for rapture. They believe they're going to be delivered from the tribulation. I think most historic pre-mills are either mid-trib or post-trib. So they're looking for the tribulation. In this case, they're looking for the rapture, but there's still at least how many years before, <coughs> before the end of the world? Okay, another 1,007. So, okay, so on this view, you have at least 1,007. On this view, you have at least 1,007. Now, here's something I had never actually thought about with the Amel position, but in the Amel position, what is the next thing that we're looking for? your Amel. Second coming, okay. Uh, what about the, the um, what about the, uh, uh, the, the uh, first of all, the millennium, the thousand years? Where are they? <laughs> okay, so it'd be from, it'd be from the first coming all the way to the second coming, so that would be right now. What about the um, tribulation? What's that? Now. It's now, okay. So the thousand years is not a golden age. It's a thousand years of tribulation now, <laughs> okay. Isn't it interesting how um, there's different views on this? Okay. That's right. Christ is reigning now. During the thousand years, that's his reign. So he's currently reigning. This is realized eschatology, okay. All right, now... If what we're looking for is the second coming, when, when is the end of the world in this scenario? Well, actually, it would be at the second coming. But we don't know the number. No, we don't know. We, don't, we, we, we couldn't say it's going to be at least this long or at least this long because theoretically it could be tonight, right? So on this view, the end of the world could be any time, any time at all, okay? So I guess you, what would you say? Um, we, just, we just don't know. <laughs> okay, and um, all right. Now with regard to the, to the post-mill view, when, when would Christ be coming? Well, what, what's the next thing we're looking for in the post-mill view? What's that? Well, it, of course, it depends. Uh, actually, some, some post-mill believe that the uh, millennium is, is again, this, this time frame, 1,000 thousand years. Uh, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention this. Um, this is one thing I'm not quite clear on. Maybe, uh, maybe I can get some help on this. But um, in, in the, um, in the, during the 1,000 years, Satan is, he is bound at the beginning, and he's released towards the end, right? On the Amil view, at least it was my understanding, there would be some kind of a scuffle just prior to the second coming, which means that um, I guess we wouldn't say technically we, we wouldn't know at all, but once he's released, we'd have to know exactly how long that, that strife is going to go on uh, because once that ends or when Christ comes to end it, that would be it. So maybe the next thing we're looking for isn't so much the second coming of Christ here as it is that... Um, that last scuffle when Satan is released. It's, it's also worth pointing out that quite clearly the thousand years is seen as symbolic. 
Right. That's right. Uh, there are some post mills who Kathy already mentioned would see the thousand years as being a period within this time frame would be a period of, or it still would be an indistinct uh, long period of time, not necessarily a literal thousand, although I'm sure there are some post mills that may believe that. But there would be a time frame in here where things get really good and that would be the, the thousand years being referred to. But I, I do think the thousand years clearly refers to the time between the binding of Satan and Christ's ministry and, and just before the second coming when he's released. All right, so uh, anyway, on the post mill view, uh, what are we looking for next? Uh, I think, I forget what, somebody contributed something, but I forget what it was now. What's that? Oh, the golden age, right. All right, so we would be looking for things to improve and to get better than they are right now, right? So we'd look for some continual improvements. And then once, let's say, once that improvement comes, and that, let's say that happens within the thousand year time frame, it's going to be sustained for a period of time which is sort of indeterminately long. And then there's going to be that release of Satan at the end and whatever time frame is here, which we'd have that same time frame in here, uh, things aren't going to be so great, but we do know it's going to end with the second coming of Christ. So with regard to the post-mill view, theoretically, the end of the world could be much further away than it would be in any of these other views. Okay. Now, I thought, okay, just, just so we understand this, um, you know, we've got at least 1,007 here, at least 1,007 we have here maybe a very short period of time, maybe it's a matter of weeks or months, uh, perhaps even less time than that before the end of the world could come. So we'd probably, if we hold to this position, be paying much more attention to end of the world scenarios, at least that potential is there. Okay. But we'd always compare it though with whether or not the Lord is actually finished with his plan. And of course, how can we know whether or not he's finished? Well, that's, that's what we're going to look at uh, for a few minutes uh, now. But, okay, so anyway, on this view, it could be, well, theoretically, it could be thousands of years away, right? Okay, well, let's, let's take a few moments then and try to brainstorm a little bit now that we realize or, or have an idea of what these views are um, actually looking at. But can you think of anything in Scripture Actually, I think I mentioned this last time we met and we're dealing with this subject. Can you think of anything in Scripture that indicates that his return can't be tonight besides, let's say, the release of Satan? That, that was something else that, um, uh, well, just thought of on this one. Uh, but besides the release of Satan, is there anything else in Scripture that would indicate that his coming is a ways off, or do we, are we forced to, um, to conclude that um, he could come any time? Well, yeah, it does. You have the, um, all of his enemies being subdued. Okay. Now, could that happen with him, like, almost immediately? Well, there's, there's a good question. Okay, and that's probably the reply that the ah mill would make, make to the post mill, is couldn't he, couldn't he do it overnight? I mean, could, could feasibly, could the Lord seat his son at his right hand with the promise he's going to subdue all of his enemies and allow that to continue for 2,000 years with perhaps just a few percent of those enemies being subdued and then the very last minute just slam them all to the ground? Okay, now am I, I don't know if I'm being a little bit too uh, drastic there, but that, that's kind of, the way it would go, right? It wouldn't be a gradual subjection, but it would be just some of his enemies get subdued and then finally, boom, they all get subdued. Well, that's, that's possible. I mean, certainly one thing we have to take into account is that on the, even on this post-mill view, if things get really, really good during this time frame, there is going to be this scuffle right here where the enemies that were subdued get loosened for a bit. And then they get flattened in uh, a rather quick order. So on any view, something like that's going to happen. If, um, if, the, if the majority of the church is the one that sits with Satan, the true man, Jacob, um, and there are many, where do these things come from? I mean, why are there so many different views?
Well, <clears throat> Well, it, it does spread into the church somewhat because most of the views that, that I've been exposed to have actually come from people who are in the church. But a lot of the end of the world scenarios for the dispensationalists come by watching the news and looking at what's going on in Europe and trying to combine with what they see going on in Europe with Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the statue with the ten toes. And they're looking at Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation and thinking that you know the seven churches are different time frames and we happen to be in you know, the, the time frame closest to when these events began and you'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars in Matthew 24 and so they say, well, we hear those things so we must be in the end times. Uh, and then, of course, the more charismatic churches look at those passages that have to do with in the last, well, in the last days God will pour out of his spirit and your sons and daughters will prophesy and from that they conclude that these are the last days when as a matter of fact, that prophecy regarding the last days had to do with the days of Pentecost when the Lord poured out his spirit in those days. Matthew 24 has to do with 70 AD. So does the book of Revelation, at least uh, from, from my perspective. Um, so they're, they're misusing the scriptures and, and the, the ten toes and so forth. I'm sorry, the statue of the feet with the ten toes uh, really has to do with the, uh, the Caesars of Rome. Um, which existed in the days when the kingdom of heaven was set up, when Jesus Christ came, which is what the, the prophecy was actually all about. Anyway. But would you say that a lot of these, um, this isn't a problem. I mean, all these theories that are being pushed out there, many of them come from <coughs> people that believe that there is going to be an end of the world. Well, there's a lot, of course, coming from dispensational premillennialism because they believe we're in the last days. There's a lot coming from charismatic churches because we believe we're in, in last days. Of course, Harold Camping just uh, at least put some people through some concern when he was predicting the end of the world again and again and again. Uh, and there's always going to be people, perhaps well-meaning in the church, that are going to do that. But a lot of it's really emanating from the, the pre-mill camp. I'm not sure how much from historic pre-mill, but definitely a lot from the dispensational pre-mill. Just from a, a human perspective, you can grasp you know, sensationalism by the kind of pasty morsels. You know, it's, a, it's a kind of morbid appeal for that kind of stuff. People lap it up and they give money to support that kind of ministry. But the satirists describe that as just like human nature. And you do have to kind of keep the excitement high all the time to keep your audience, don't you? So you're always looking for something to build up <coughs> as an end of the world scenario, or at least a dispensational pre mill isn't end of the world, but it's at least starting that, that countdown, the 1,007 years to the end, they're looking for the rapture. There's all these different things that indicate it's close. Okay, but is there anything else now in scripture? There was the one thing that Kathy mentioned, the idea of Christ, the, the subjection of his enemies under his feet. We, we looked at that in some detail on uh, Sunday morning. Uh, the Father has made a promise to the Son that all of his enemies will be subjected to him. And the last enemy is death, and that one he will subdue when he returns and raises the dead. So all of his enemies have to be subdued prior to that. And the question is, is it, is it in one sort of mass blow, or is it, um, is it it's perhaps more progressive than that over a period of time? Is there anything else? Actually, we looked at several on Sunday. Can you think of any others? Yes, Kathy? Okay, all of Christ's church needs to be gathered. Now, are we at a point, do you suppose, in history where we can say enough has been gathered to where we can expect Christ in any time? Do we have any indication in Scripture that, that the Lord is going to save people from every nation under heaven? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, you know what, uh, there's a passage in Revelation 5.9, I'm not sure if we ever think about it in this context, but uh, it says, and they sang a new song, saying, worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain, and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And if we take that absolutely, to refer to every people group in the entire world, then we'd have to conclude, unless the gospel has actually reached every people group, then Christ really can't come at any time. 
Now again, uh, here's, here's another thing. It just reminded me of another reason why people think the end of the world or at least the second coming of Christ might be near because didn't, uh, didn't Jesus tell his own disciples you know, to be ready? Uh, didn't he say, you know, if, you, if the, uh, the owner of the house knew at what hour the thief was coming, he would have been ready and wouldn't have allowed his house to be broken into? Uh, wasn't he telling them to be ready and to be watching because your Lord is coming at an hour you don't think he is? Uh, doesn't that give you the expectation that Christ's return could be at any moment, especially if he told them it, was, it could happen any moment back then for them, that uh, you know, we're 2,000 years beyond that. Shouldn't we be closer to that event than they were? But then take into account here that the Lord did purchase people from every nation. Could the Lord have come at any moment in those days? Is that possible? I mean, I suppose he could if he wanted to, but is that what he's told us he's going to do? He's not going to go against his word. Now, when he told the disciples to, to be ready, was he referring to his second coming? Because the Lord had actually purchased men from every tribe, nation, and so forth. Had that actually even, were they anywhere near getting the gospel out to everyone in those days? So how could he be telling the disciples that his coming was near? Actually, if you guys have been following the, uh, all that we've looked at over the years on this, the answer should be obvious, right? Well, was his coming, his second coming was nowhere near. That's not what he was talking about, but he was talking about 70 AD. That event was near, but as far as the second coming, it, it's still a ways off from us because uh, every people group has not been um, reached at this point. Now again, I, I do believe that Paul is, is, meant to, or, uh, is saying in Romans chapter 11, and I think we'd all agree, I think we just sort of say it as a matter of fact, that all of the Lord's people need to be gathered in before the Lord can return again. And I think pretty much everyone's in agreement that that's what's in view here in Romans 11 verses 12 through 15. When he's, Paul talking about the Jews says this, now if their transgression is riches for the world, and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? But I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, if somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Now, he could be referring to, you know, if, if a Jew receives Christ, that he's actually spiritually resurrected. But it's also possible that he's speaking about a, a larger, you know, he's sort of going larger with this, that um, basically if, if the Jews reject Jesus Christ and the Lord turns to the Gentiles and, and it turns out to bring about their reconciliation to God because he's trying to provoke the Jews to jealousy, well, then how much better will it be if the Jews actually embrace their own Messiah, he says that will actually end up being life from the dead. That could very well be referring to um, resurrection. I mean, the end time uh, when the Lord returns again because basically if he saved all the Gentiles and he saves all the Jews, then there's really nobody left to be saved. Everybody's saved, then comes the end. But I think we would have to um, at least deduce that anyway from the fact that God actually created us and the world and everything to work out his plan of redemption. Once he's saved everyone that he's planning on saving, there's really no need to allow history to continue to, to go on. So anyway, I, I think, though, that it's, it's without question that the Lord will gather in all his elect before he brings an end to all things and that he has some of his people in among every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And if the gospel hasn't actually reached to that distance, then it really can't come yet. Yes? Where is, of course, the end time? Well, let's see. Um, I'm not sure if everybody has access to it yet. <laughs> we can evangelize by bringing computers and Internet lines. Half the world's population, nearly four years now. Half the population? Okay, we need all of them, though, don't we? <laughs> we'll, we'll still have those countries that, that basically are unreached, so... Um, there's a lot of. Well, would we say it's going to happen tomorrow? Yeah. So it, it, it is going to be a little ways off. And 
I, I guess we're assuming that the people who are reached in the countries that haven't been reached are close to other countries that don't have the internet. They can kind of go in there and begin to get those people. But it is going to be, I would say, outside of our lifetime before everybody hears the gospel. So I, I'm just saying that I don't think we can expect the Lord to come tonight. I mean, that's, that's the um, expectation that you have in dispensational premillennialism. I mean, Jesus could come any time at all. He could have come years ago. I was, you know, told to be waiting for him myself, and so were many other people. But anyway, this, this I think, is the main reason why he cannot yet come. Now, Donna? Well, actually, I think, I think what Paul is indicating in Romans 11 is a process by which the partial hardening to the Jews and the turning to the Gentiles was meant not only to save the Gentiles, but to provoke the Jews to receive their own Messiah because they see the Gentiles actually receiving Christ and all the promises God made to them. Then it provokes them to jealousy to receive him, but I don't think it happens in mass. I think it's a question of uh, process. So that as the Lord is turning to the Gentiles, he is provoking the Jews. And, and uh, so he's, he is gathering his people out of the Jews and out of the Gentiles at the same time. And actually, he concludes that chapter by saying, and thus, or in this way, all Israel shall be saved. And I think by Israel there, he's, he's probably talking about those Jews who are actually the elect among the Jews, those who are true Israelites, rather than perhaps the... Jews and Gentiles are the church, although it is possible that he is referring to that too. Either way, that is the process by which all Israel will be gathered, and then the Lord will return. The deliverer will come from Zion and so forth. Okay. Now, any other indications in Scripture, perhaps, that his coming might be a little ways off? Certainly, I think we would all, uh, of all the reasons, perhaps, that are here, I think the one that's just been mentioned would be the one we, we may all agree on. But there may be some others that we you know, maybe don't agree on the interpretation, such as the fact that um, all of his enemies haven't yet been subjected, although I think we all agree that that hasn't happened. <laughs> okay, So at least that has to take place, and uh, all the elect have yet to be gathered in, and there are elect from every people group, so he isn't uh, going to be coming at least tonight or tomorrow, okay? But uh, here's some other things to think about. Uh, some of the things we actually looked at this past Lord's Day. Um, had, well, and I think that some of these go along with what we've already seen. The kingdom of heaven, how, how big is it supposed to get? How encompassing is it supposed to get? Are there any indications in the scripture as far as the extent of the kingdom? And, and the extent of the kingdom is what? Uh, from sea to sea and sword to sword. Okay. Uh, and as, as um, actually the Lord tells Daniel in uh, Daniel 2.35 that the, the stone cut without hands grows into a great mountain that fills the whole earth. Okay, so it's going to fill the whole earth uh, from you know, the river to the ends of the sea and so forth. And that is referring to the kingdom of heaven. Daniel 2.35, but the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And the interpretation in verse 44, in the days of those kings, by the way, those are the ten toes, it's talking about the Roman Empire at the time, it, or in the state that it existed when Jesus Christ came into the world. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms. But it will itself endure forever. And I think going along with that, when the Lord tells his disciples in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, to go and make disciples of all the nations, do you think there's any connection between, between these things? His kingdom is going to fill the whole earth. Uh, it's going to crush and put an end to all these kingdoms. Go and make disciples of all the nations. Uh, we have the parables that I mentioned also with regard to uh, the parable of the, um, yeah, the mustard seed, which um, is small but grows into a great tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. It, 
it's, I believe, agreed on by the editors that that is quoting Daniel chapter 4, where Nebuchadnezzar has the dream about the tree. You know, your kingdom, you know, the tree is your kingdom, uh, king. This is what we read in Daniel 4, verses 11 through 12. The tree grew large and became strong, and its height reached to the sky. And it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the sky dwelt in its branches. Notice the birds of the sky and the branches. And all living creatures fed themselves from it. Again, the kingdom of heaven, uh, when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants, becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. What is it referring to? Well, the same imagery was used in the uh, Old Testament to refer to King Nebuchadnezzar's uh, kingdom. And uh, in verses 20 through 22 of Daniel 4, we, we get the interpretation. The tree that you saw, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached to the sky and was visible to all the earth, and whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in which was food for all under, the beasts, uh, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the sky lodged, it is you, O king. For you have become great and grown strong, and your majesty has become great and reached to the sky and your dominion to the end of the earth. So I believe what the Lord was saying in this parable of the mustard seed is that his kingdom was going to become great and it was going to reach to the ends of the earth. And basically that the nations would find its substance uh, from the kingdom of heaven even as they did under Nebuchadnezzar's. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar's was a worldwide dominion, so is the Lord's kingdom, a worldwide dominion. And as it was in the days of King Nebuchadnezzar, that it had a strong influence upon the nations. I think also in this case, especially because the birds of the heavens come and they find refuge. Uh, as the scriptures also say, all the kings of the earth are basically going to learn the law of God, going to flow, as it were, to Jerusalem. Now, also the parable that follows, the parable of the leaven, again, the the influence begins small, but it becomes great. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. So the kingdom of heaven is going to leaven. It's going to affect and influence the whole earth. Uh, the Lord's Prayer, petition that the Lord calls us to pray, has not yet actually been fulfilled. And yet the Lord tells us to pray for it. It seems to go along quite well with what we see here. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And again, uh, he hasn't yet subjected all of his enemies under his feet. Paul says every knee shall bow to him, every tongue confess. Uh, and then just one last one. And that's one I believe you've heard before. I did make reference in the sermon on the Lord's Day in the morning to the conditions that Solomon, looking ahead in one of the Psalms, Psalm 72, what he would say, what he said that the reign of the Messiah would be like on the earth, that it would be a time of peace and a time of protection and a time of abundance. It seems to go along with what Isaiah predicts regarding the, um, the kingdom of the Messiah. Now this Isaiah 65 verses 17 through 25, uh, there is a, a, a question as to where it fits on, on the timeline. It's the one that talks about you know, the wonderful conditions that exist or are going to exist at some point uh, in history. And the question is, is this referring to the new heavens and the new earth or is this referring to the old heavens and the old earth? And of course, the things that go on in here seem to be referring to the old earth because there's death. Uh, because there's the idea of uh, wickedness, there's the idea of uh, things wearing out or not wearing out and so forth. There's the idea of peace. Um, the, the only thing that makes it difficult is the opening statement, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. It seems to be referring to the new heavens and the new earth, and yet there are things in this text that can't refer to the new heavens and the new earth. Let me just read it. Isaiah 65, 17 through 25. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create re Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people, and there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. 
No longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his days. For the youth will die at the age of 100. And the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed. They will build houses and inhabit them, and they will also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build and another inhabit. They will not plant and another eat. For as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people. And my chosen ones will wear out the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they are the offspring of those blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. It will also come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will graze together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food, and they will do no evil or harm in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. Well, again, if this is referring to the eternal state and the new heavens and the new earth, you do have the problem of death. I mean, because people here are dying. The youth dies at 100. The person who doesn't reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed and so forth. And Anyway, there's planting, there's eating, there's bearing children, all these different things that you wouldn't expect to see in the new heavens and the new earth where we are like the angels in heaven. We neither marry nor are given in marriage, therefore aren't having children, and we aren't dying anymore because there's no more death. We're suffering. But if this is symbolic, uh, what is it symbolizing? It, it seems to be symbolizing some type of physical blessings, but the question is, have we ever actually experienced these kinds of blessings? Well, if you combine this with Psalm 72 with regard to the reign of the Messiah, you actually do end up with an argument that during Christ's reign, while his enemies are being subjected uh, and people begin to uh, submit to him, even his enemies give feigned obedience and begin to walk in the ways of the Lord, that you actually do have a, um, a growth in physical blessings that come. And really, I think it could happen on either of these two scenarios. You realize the historic premill and the dispensational premill take that passage and they put it in the millennium, at this time frame after the second coming of Christ. And I guess what we do is we put it in the millennium as well, only our millennium is, is here before Jesus comes. Because we do know from Scripture, if you'll recall the lengthy eschatology course we went through, once Jesus comes, there is a definitive end to human history. The new heavens and the new earth come sometime. From the, between the time he comes and, and raises the dead and, and converts and translates the living and gathers everybody together for the final judgment and the time when the final judgment is over because the kingdom is already prepared for this, his people to inherit. The lake of fire is ready for the wicked to be cast into. So um, that thousand years has to be here. And perhaps we would agree that this must be referring to that time frame, but it's a question of what it actually means. Uh, are there blessings of this variety, and have we seen them? So again, if you put all these things together, it, it does indicate that Christ's second coming has to be a little ways off, especially if these things mean um, literally what they seem to suggest, that there is going to be uh, Christ's enemies subjected, and again, blessings, physical blessings that come because the kingdom of heaven is advancing in the world, because uh, it's growing into a great tree, because it's leavening the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, several uh, uh, pecks of flour. Um, okay, so anyway, uh, as far as applying it to the end of the world scenario, again, the, uh, the thing is <clears throat> the world isn't going to end until God's plan for the world is complete. And if his plan includes uh, bringing in more people because all people groups haven't been reached, and especially if it includes the subjection of all of his enemies and this great time of blessing and peace, well, then his kingdom is a little ways off, especially if that time of peace is going to be a prolonged period. And then, of course, there would be that time frame when Satan is released and uh, there's that scuffle at the end, that escalating persecution against the church whatever that time frame is as well, then will come the end. So all this to say that we really don't need to worry when we hear about differing scenarios about the end of the world, even, even the idea of, um, well, I think perhaps the, um, the most serious ones that we can think of right now might be, um, let's say Iran develops an, you know, the ability to deploy a nuclear weapon or uh, North Korea does the same thing and they escalate some kind of a nuclear warfare. Um, 
that's not going to be the end of the world. And as a matter of fact, I don't, don't personally believe the Lord's going to allow that to, um, uh, well, to, to come to fruition because he has a plan for the world. And that plan has to be fulfilled, whatever it may be. We might ask the question whether that includes the devastation of parts of the world. Well, it may. There have been periods uh, like the Black Plague that destroyed a huge percentage of Europe's population, I believe. Something like that could happen, but the Lord is not going to allow the world to end until his plan is complete. And we do have the assurance as his people that whatever happens in this world, the Lord is going to work it together for our good, even if it means that uh, we die and whatever particular thing may happen in this world, it just means that the Lord's going to boost us into heaven more quickly. And uh, as Paul says, to die and to be with Christ is very much better. So anyway, um, I think that's probably more than enough to say on this particular topic. Um, next week we're going to consider uh, how to use these end of the world scenarios that do crop up from time to time. Uh, to our advantage in spreading or advancing the kingdom of heaven because these things don't happen by accident. And people get concerned about these things for a reason. And I think um, perhaps the Lord is bringing that about so that we can step in with some, well, with gospel and uh, with some assurances that God has a better plan uh, for his world. Are there any uh, questions, comments on this? All right, then let's, um, let's bow in a moment of prayer and, and we'll um, break for a moment and gather in the back for some more prayer.